Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project uh, conducted out of Washington, D.C. And we're conducting the interview today at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And the head of the program locally is Brian Powers, who is our cameraman today. And we have the honor and privilege today of interviewing World War II veteran Robert Leroy Headley. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. And uh, is it all right to call you Bob or Robert? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Bob, uh, if you would, uh, where were you born and what was the date of your birth? Well, let's see. I was born uh, March 10th, 1925 in Providence Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. I see. Now, uh, uh, and your parents' names? Paul Leroy Headley was his name. My mother's name was Constance Rowena Wagley before she got married. I see. And what did your father do for a living? My father was an insurance agent, one hell of a good salesman. He used to sell insurance when people didn't know where they were going to get their next meal. Uh, we never missed a meal. My father was just one hell of a good salesman. I see. Uh, where did you live at? Uh, uh, what was your address there? We lived you? in a place that was called Highland Park, Michigan, which r is right in the middle of Detroit, and it has its own mayor and its own police force, and uh, it's it really is just surrounded by Detroit. I see. It was a very pretty place in those days. You could get up in the morning and hear the birds sing, and you could hear the boats down on the river. You could hear the trolley cars going by, but other than that, it was just a very, very beautiful, wonderful place. What river was that? Detroit River. The Detroit River. Uh, did your mother work? My mother was a concert pianist, ah. and uh, she uh, worked for the Burroughs Adding Machine Company. Uh, she was a highfalutin secretary for them. And that's pretty good in those days, you know, there's hardly anybody highfalutin. So right. anyway, um, she um, met my father uh, downtown. She used to play uh, in the biggest, the biggest uh, church downtown. It was, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it right now. But anyway, when she met him, she talked to him about, uh, she played the organ in church, and so he went to church it was, it was an, an Episcopal church, that's what it was. My father was a Baptist, so just imagine, he must have been really stricken to go there to the Episcopal church and pump her organ, you know, kept the air going so that the thing would work. Anyway, um, she, got, she used to like to play on the stage, and they used to have amateur hours, and my mother wasn't an amateur, but she used to like to get up and show her stuff. And so they said to her one time, and, and uh, you met, met Paul where now? And she said, well, I, I met him, uh, you know, downtown, and uh, he's the guy who used to pump my organ. And everybody laughed, and my mother didn't even know why. You know. So anyway, uh, that's the early part. Uh, what else would you like to know? <laughs> uh, did, did you have any brothers and sisters? <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had one brother, and he was a wonderful beautiful boy. I remember I was three years old, and he was just a little tiny guy, and he was just adorable. I loved him. I even invited the coal man to come in. I said, come on in and see my brother. Come on, come on, come on. He didn't come in. Well, anyway, I love my brother then. I love him now. He's what still was alive. What, was his what is his name? His name is Bruce James Headley. Where does he live? He lives right now in uh, Rockford, Illinois, okay. and he spent many years uh, doing different things. He was a music teacher, and so uh, I think the reason he became a music teacher, he fell on his head too often. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I hit him in the head with a hammer one time by accident. Yeah. I was just swinging around and <laughs> right in the forehead. I thought he was going to grow another head. Oh but anyway, it, everything worked out okay. and. Uh, he married a woman that I just absolutely despised. She despised me too. So I spent many years not seeing my brother because I 
didn't want him to have the problem of having his brother whom he loved, that's me, and his wife whom he probably even loved more, that was her, have a problem. So I stayed away. She died. Now I can see him. Ah, uh, okay. What, what it's a better world, too. <laughs> What schools did you go to, starting with elementary, if you recall? Oh, I went to several elementary schools. We used to move all over the city. So I, I think the first one I ever went to was a, a Barnum School, a very, very pretty school. And uh, I was in, let's see, kindergarten. I was the toughest guy in kindergarten. So anyway, oh, uh, we... Uh, moved and I think the next school was uh, Fair, no that wasn't it, Taylor School. That was uh, in a Jewish neighborhood and uh, that's when I became a minority. You know there was hardly anybody in school on Jewish holidays, maybe three or four kids would just sit there and waste time. You know I should have gone to the synagogue, I'd have been better off. <laughs> anyway, um, we went to Longfellow School, which uh, is where I had to scrap to maintain my position, and that was in the third grade. And then we went to Fairbanks, that was the last elementary school, and from there we went to Hutchins Intermediate School, which was uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grades, and from there to Cass Tech High School, which was two of a kind, one of one of two. The Cleveland Tech and Cass Tech were the only two high schools that had the idea that uh, they were going to train people to do something instead of train them to go to college. Mm -hmm. So there was no languages of any kind. What you would do is have uh, English, mathematics, history, and from there on it was all technical subjects. A trade school, so to speak, like? This, or not. this was this was high school, and what we had was a course in. Uh, uh, I was an architectural student, so we built houses to the scale of one inch equals a foot. So of course that's pretty small, but we used to sell those houses for fifty bucks. That's a lot of money in in the depression. The second semester we built a house to half scale, six inches equals a foot. And we put the corners together with screws so it was like a prefab. And people used to buy those things for their children to play in a playhouse. And they could take them out there and put them back together just putting the screws back in. So we also had a, a course in electric where we wired up a house. And we had a course in uh, uh, furnaces where we uh, learned about it. We didn't do anything about it. We learned about it. And we had a course in uh, uh, law which had to do with only real estate. Real estate law and maybe a few torts, but nothing deep. It was only one little book. Mm -hmm. However, that shows that we really had a big understanding. And, and then we had uh, drafting classes. That was one of the chief things. And heck, before that, I'd been dr doing drafting when I was in the eighth grade. So from the eighth grade, the rest of my life, I made drawings. Yeah. And, yes. And, and well prepared for life, you know, with all that background. Well, um, that's true. And in fact, if you graduated from that high school, you had a job immediately with the William Kahn Architects, which was a big architectural firm in Detroit. They'd hire all the Cass Tech graduates. Anyway, there was one other school like that. It was Cleveland Tech. I didn't go to that. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful place, too, I understand. We also did sheet metal drafting, which uh, permits you to lay out sheet metal and put it together so that it makes things. And I used to do that just for, the f just for fun. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> that's called descriptive geometry today. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was sheet metal drafting in those days. Yeah. So, um, uh, we also did chemistry and physics. And uh, I think that covers the gamut there. 
I learned more English from the wonderful English teacher there than I ever learned prior or since. Wonderful woman. Yeah. So I had a lot of good teachers. What year did you graduate from high school? I didn't graduate. I joined the Navy. Oh, did you? I used to hate going to school. Well, let's jump ahead then just for a second. What year did you join the Navy? 43. Okay. Then you were in school on December the 7th, 1941. I was. Pearl Harbor Day. I wanted to go to, go to war then. My father said no. You, tell us where you were when you heard about it. And your I was reaction. 16. Heck, I thought I'm ready. My father says, you're not ready. So I went all the way through my 17th year, and I thought, my God, I need to join up. If I don't join up, you know, I'm going to be in the Army. I didn't want to be in the Army. I wanted to be in the Navy. So I went down on the last day, and I got some papers for the V6 program, and I told my father. I lied to my father. I said, Dad, I'm going to be in the V12 program. They're going to send me to college, but I need to have you sign these papers. He dutifully signed them. I got in the V6 program, and I was going. What is a V6 program and a V12 program? Well, V12 was people that were going to become officers, and they were going to be educated at a fine university somewhere, anywhere. So that was V12. V6 means your dog meat, you get to go right away. So anyway, I wanted to go, and I wanted to go so badly that I lied to my father. Whew. That was hard to do. What did your mother think of you going in there? Well, my mother, she was out in left field. She never knew much about what the hell was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she lived in a fool's paradise. My father was down to earth. I really loved my father, and I still do. Yeah. Uh, so what day did you actually join the, the Navy? Well, then? I went down on the 9th, the uh, day before my the birthday. The 9th of? Of, of uh, March. March? Yeah. And they flunk me because I had porcelain in my teeth, porcelain fillings. So I went and I spent about three hours holding my mouth open, got all those porcelain fillings drilled out, and I got silver put in. I went back and I thought, now I'm ready to go, and they closed the place, and I'm standing there just distraught, thinking, oh my goodness. And so this officer came out, Lieutenant Sikorsky, I knew I'd remember his name. Lieutenant Sikorsky said, son, what's troubling you? What's the matter? I told him about how I got flunked and how I had my teeth drilled out, and he said, let me see. So I opened my mouth, and he looked in there, and he said, you come back tomorrow, son. I'll get your papers predated. You see me first. So I saw him first. He gave me a piece of paper that went to, with my records, and every time it went to a new typist, he'd see that. And he put me in the USN. Somewhere the paper got lost. From there on, I was in the USNR. <laughs> U.S. Navy Reserves? Yes, that? right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like I was half in the USN and half in the USNR. Later on, it came into being a good thing. Uh, I see. Yes. Um, so you actually joined then the Navy on the 9th of March? Yeah, 19th. I volunteered, but you know, you'd never know it. <laughs> <laughs> 1943. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did they send you first, or did you get to go back home after you joined? Well, I uh, stood there, and I remember this. The chief got up, and he said, all right, fellas, uh, son, uh, just stand in line, right? Uh, just back up against the wall there. Okay, that's fine. All right, raise your hand and repeat after me. And we raised our hand and repeated after him. And he said, all right, men of the Navy. I thought, by God, I grew up really quick. I'm a man. <laughs> oh. So I got to go home and tell everybody that I was leaving the next day. My father cried. I had a difficult time to keep from crying myself. He is the best man that I ever met in my life or ever hoped to meet. I would like to be able to emulate him. I come close. I miss. So uh, 
So you left immediately? Well, the, the next or, day he took off work and drove me down there and we talked about things and he bought me a chain to put around my neck for my ID when I got it. And so I got on the troop train and went to Great Lakes. Which is located where? Um, Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. Okay. And um, what kind of training did you go through there at Great Lakes? Well, the usual horrible thoughts, you know, like every day they want to make you miserable. And I thought to myself, what the hell have you done to yourself here? You know, every day was just more drudgery and foolishness. And I found out you shouldn't volunteer. You know, <laughs> like uh, they, they would say, all right, um, is there anybody here that knows shorthand? Well, I wish I had, but I didn't. So they said, step forward if you know shorthand. So the guys that step forward, they say, we're a little shorthanded here. Go to work here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was glad I didn't know shorthand. So that taught me a few things. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Anyway, uh, we uh, had what they called happy hour. It really wasn't happy. It was like you take a rifle and you give it everything you got, and then you get to rest. You hold the rifle out. It weighs nine pounds. You can't even hold a penny out there for very long. Right. Anyway, you hold the rifle out there, and pretty soon everybody's standing like this. <laughs> you know, resting, uh, uh, resting elbows on their uh, hips. So I, I um, made a bad mistake one time, and um, I was talking to one of the chief petty officers, and he was giving me hell or something. And I said, I suppose you're going to give me happy hour, right? <laughs> he said, you got that right. <laughs> I got happy hour all right, and I was not happy. So anyway, we got out of there. So I went to signal school after that, San Diego. San Diego is a, a place that is just horrible. You know, the weather is good. There's fog every morning. It's all right. It's a wonderful climate, but there's no girls. You know, they're all taken up. So what that means is uh, you need to get the hell out of there and get some place where you can find some young woman that appreciates you. Anyway. You didn't go across the border, did you? No, 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 no. You know, I was uh, kind of careful. But I used to see Ginger Rogers go by every once in a while. I used to think, God, I wish she'd take me home with her. <laughs> no luck, no luck. Now, uh, <laughs> what's a signalman? What is that? Well, a signalman does a Plain as flag a waving, you know, semaphore. Mm -hmm. Very seldom. I only used semaphore one time in my life. That was going into Pearl Harbor. You know, they, they're close enough where you can use semaphore. And it's pretty fast but mostly it's flashing light. You know, the Morse code on flashing light and signal flags where you have to have a signal book and a two flag hoist, that means two flags run up together, would mean something and you'd have to look it up in the signal book. Heck, they were about that thick and about eight and a half by 11. So you didn't have to learn them. You always had the book up there and you could look it up. But then at night they had lights, and there were three lights, and it could be green, 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 red, 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 green, red, 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 green, green, and so on. Mm -hmm. All the various examples or, or uh, arrangements you could get with red and green lights, three deep. And they all had some meaning. Like uh, I remember one of the meanings was uh, the ships are all coming like this, and they had to go 45 degrees all at once. They all turned 45 degrees, or the other way, depending on the color of the lights. One of the others was yeah, the, all the lines would go ahead, and at a certain point, they'd all turn like this, where you kept in line with the guy in front of you. And I don't remember anything else. But um, heck, one time we were in the Mediterranean, and the lights went on, we were, we were being attacked. and. Uh, so the lights went on, and uh, boy, um, things just went to hell. You know, you're supposed to be in complete darkness. So um, I saw some lights, 
And you know, uh, on a ship, when it's coming towards you, you can see the red light and the green light. The green's on the starboard or left right side. The red is on the port or left side. And also, there's a mast light, a white light at the top. I could see red lights and green lights at the same time. That means ships are doing this. So instead of going like this, they're going like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a just terrible thing. Everybody had to put their running lights on to keep from having collisions out there. Nobody got sunk. Amazing. That was a real screw up. Sounds like it. So how long did you stay at San Diego? In four in months. Four months. Is there anything else about your training there you want to share with us? Well, there was one good thing. When we got through, we had an old chief. He had an arm full of hash marks, gold hash marks. It meant he never did anything wrong, or at least didn't get caught doing anything wrong. That was it. So anyway, he said, all right, stand proud. You're, let's see. You're a man of war's men. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I was proud. Yes. Anyway, I didn't get on a man of war. I went in the, in the, arm, <laughs> the armed guard. <laughs> what does that mean? What that means is you're still in the Navy, but you go aboard uh, merchant ships of various kinds in order to protect the cargo or the ship. The ships were armed, and what you'd try to do is uh, knock off the submarine before they knock you off. They used to surface. They finally didn't surface anymore because they were outgunned if they surfaced. So the only way they could do it is stay below the surface and try to torpedo us. And we used to have uh, uh, escorts, escort vessels like destroyers and and destroyer escorts, they called them, DEs and right. DDs. And what they used to do is uh, provide a screen to protect us from the wolf packs. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> so, now, um, we, um, I, uh, so did you go into that as soon as you left uh, San Diego and graduated down there from your training? Oh, well, no, I, we, uh, we uh, delivered uh, cargo to uh, Pearl Harbor. From San Diego? Uh, it was I mean, that's from when you we, we went from San Diego to San Francisco, where, where the uh, <laughs> armed guard station was. It was at uh, uh, Treasure Island. And uh, Treasure Island was a man-made island for the World's Fair, I think, in 1949, something like that. Anyway. Uh, they had a huge barracks there, and you know, there's all kinds of people, heck, you, people you've never even seen before and never hoped to see. You know, what they would do is get what they call a, a crew from the various numbers of people in there and assign them to a ship, and the ship would go out. So I got assigned to the William W. Campbell, and uh, so we went to we had a shakedown run first because it was a brand new ship. So we had to see if our degaussing system worked well, and that was a thing where you could, they had coils along the side of the ship that would uh, uh, repel mag magnetically any of the metal mines. So that was one of the things we did. And then we went to um, uh, Redwood City in California, which was not too far away from San Francisco, and we spent a long time there, several days, loading 120 uh, octane drums of 55 gallon drums of uh, high octane gasoline for aircraft. Filled the whole holds, five holds, filled them up with that, those 55 gallon drums, and then we got a deck cargo of freight trains loaded with ammunition. So. Freight trains. Freight train, freight cars loaded with ammunition on the deck. So we're going to Pearl Harbor with that and no escort. So that means that if we got hit, it was going to be a black spot. Anyway, uh, I used to worry about that. I worried a lot. And we got there and delivered the cargo and 
I found I didn't need to worry, and I said to myself, boy, you've got to think of something. That was terrible, coming over, being worried like that. So I thought to myself, you know, I worried for nothing because nothing happened. And if something had happened, I wouldn't have to worry anyway. So I quit worrying. It worked well. I was very happy after that. Did you? What type of weapons did you carry as a as a <clears throat> well armed guard? Right. There were there were some ships that had thirty caliber machine guns, which you might as well just throw them over the side for all they're worth. There were some ships that had a telephone pole that was supposed to represent a gun to scare people, and you throw that over the side too, and. Finally, they got to the place where they would uh, put some serious gunnery aboard the ship. Uh, I was never on a ship that didn't have less than two three-inch guns and uh, eight 20-millimeter stations. So those were fairly well-armed, you know. It was good to fend off the aircraft and, you know, you could outgun the submarines and so not too bad. Then. Toward the end, I was on a ship that had two three-inch guns forward, a five-inch 38 gun aft, um, a couple more three-inch guns aft, and 20, 20 millimeter station, eight of them. That was really a, boy, that was, hell, you could have sunk something else with that armament. Now, when you went into Pearl Harbor, were you on the Campbell at that time? Oh, yes, yes. What, is, was it a Campbell, a, a victory ship, or what was it? It was a... Uh, Liberty ship. Liberty ship. They had more Liberty ships than anything else, and it wasn't until toward the end of the war that they began to get the uh, 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 Victory ships. Yeah. Victory ships were much faster. They looked an awful lot like a like a Liberty ship, but the Liberty ships would go nine, ten knots. The Victory ships would go sixteen or seventeen knots, and uh, my tanker would go 17 or 18. So those, those were pretty good ships when you got in a, co in a convoy where you could go 16 knots. It was pretty good. And some of the older ones where they were supposed to go 9 knots, some of the ships got in a convoy that couldn't do 9 knots on their best day. So they'd fall back and the escorts would go back and say, move up, move up. And they couldn't move up. So the captains used to say things like, well, um, we have engine trouble, engine trouble, bull crap. What it was is they were making as much headway as they could, and they just didn't want to have the convoy leave them. Right. Well, sometimes they did leave them. But, um, well, that's about the way that used to work. The slow convoys would get even slower. The armed guard, how many of you would be on, like, the Campbell? Well. Sometimes there were ships that only had eight armed guard, depend on, depending on the uh, armament. And on my ship, I think we had on, on the order of 32. Mm -hmm. And uh, two of them were um, signalmen, two of them were radiomen, and the rest were either bosuns, coxswains, or gunner's mates. So. The bosun's cox and the gunner's mates all worked out, worked the guns, and the radioman and the signalman worked the uh, visual and and audio, audio signals. And your and what did you do? I was I was the signalman working the visual signaling. Okay. Yeah. And I'll tell you about that. They used to call me little little flags because they used to call all the signalmen flags. So we had a big guy, he was the, the head guy, he was Sigelman's second class. We called him Big Flags, I'm Little Flags, and then there was Big Sparks and Little Sparks. So I went into the forecastle one time where we all stepped, uh, slept, and I said, how fortuitous! Here we are! There's uh, Little Sparks, Big Sparks, Little Flags, and Big Eater. <laughs> big Eater didn't like me. <laughs> Well, you weren't a small guy. You're still a big yeah, man. Yeah, this it, guy was big. Yeah, he, heck, I only weighed 155 then. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, you have a, you look like you were pretty tall and. Uh, I was yeah. finally. 
You know, I got up to 211. I got a pus gut and everything, and and I had to, you know, ease back on the groceries. Yeah. Uh, while you're in Hawaii, we're still there, okay, in our narrative here. Uh, did you get any liberty in Hawaii? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Want to tell us about any of the liberty? Well, I, I saw the most beautiful girl I ever saw in my entire life there. Absolutely gorgeous. She was so gorgeous, I didn't even dare speak because I thought, no, I, I'm too damn ugly to talk to this girl. <laughs> Heck, I wasn't ugly, but I didn't know any better. So I didn't, I just appreciated her. Oh my God, she was beautiful. Anyway, um, I thought, well, I saw the movie where Jack Oakey, did you ever hear of Jack Oakey? Sure. Jack Oakey went into the, into the uh, jungle and he came out with a girl on a grass, two girls, one on each arm and they were both wearing grass skirts. I could hardly wait to get my grass skirt girl. So I went to, I, I was saying, can you tell me where Waikiki Beach is? And it, Hmm? What? What? Waikiki Beach? And finally somebody said, Waikiki. I said, oh, yes, yes, Waikiki. Where is that? So they told me, and I went. There was no jungle, and there was no grass skirts. So I just took my clothes off, and I had my trunks on, and I swam out. And uh, I swam out till I was half tired. Then I thought, it's time to swim back in. So I started to swim back in, and I got really tired because the tide was going out. So I got so tired I'd have to float, you know, restore my strength. And I didn't, I was afraid to float too long because I'm losing ground, you know. So I'd swim some more, swim some more, and I'd put my feet down, no soap, I'd float again. I'd damn near drown. So I fin finally got to the place where I could stand up and the water was up to here. I thought, good, I'm not swimming anymore. I went ashore and I fell asleep, I don't know for how many hours. Okay. Oh yeah, almost drowned, jeez. You know, you need to go this way instead of that way. <laughs> Did you uh, do any Liberty downtown uh, Honolulu while you were no, there? No, that was it. You know, I was so pooped, I went back to the ship and we left. Okay. <clears throat> uh, where did you go from, uh, Honolulu, uh, from, from Honolulu? Well, we uh, came back to San Francisco, then we went up to Canada. It was um, the beautiful place just across the border. Um, You're still on a Campbell now. Pardon? Are you still on Oh, a yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the name. You know, Bellingham, Washington is uh, as far north as you go in the United States, just across the border. Vancouver? Vancouver, yeah. Vancouver's a beautiful place. And we steamed around there and saw all the lovely trees. And it was a wonderful thing. So we um, found that that was a pretty nice place. All the guys went to war and they left all the women home. You know, it was wonderful. So we did pretty well there. <laughs> and I won't go into detail. Go on. <laughs> they had a strange system where you could come in and uh, drink for an hour, they'd close the place up, and for an hour you had to get out. Then you could come back and drink for another hour, and then you'd close it up and get out. And I think they did that because alcohol was scarce. So I think they want to make it last. I, <laughs> I don't know of any other reason. Or, or keep you guys uh, controllable. Well, we were controllable, I'll tell you. <laughs> yep. Well, anyway, it was a wonderful place. Uh, and the women were all man hungry, and oh my, it was lovely. That's all I can tell you. Okay. So we. So what was your job there in Vancouver besides? <laughs> well, my job was just to be with a ship, you know. And yeah. when the ship tied up, they took on cargo, and we took on a bunch of wheat. <coughs> so we uh, took the wheat over to Italy, and we uh, went down the coast all the way down to Panama and through the Panama Canal, and I almost drowned in the Panama Canal too, but anyway. How? <laughs> well, well, we had to tie up in the lake, well, moored out in the lake. You know, there's, there, the lake is high, and the water runs to the Pacific and to the Atlantic. So the lake is pretty close to the middle of, uh, middle of the canal, that's part of the canal. And uh, 
So we are moored there, and I think part of the reason is to let some of the uh, Navy ships. I was not on a Navy ship. I was on a merchant ship. So anyway, the Navy ships had to get through there. So anyway, uh, the guys decided to swim. So they they jumped in and they swam out to the mooring buoy, which is a pretty good piece away. And I went and got my trunks and jumped in there. And by the time I jumped in, they were all on the mooring buoy resting up. And I swam out there. And now the mooring buoy is shaped like it's a round platform and it goes down in the ocean like this and then tapers off that way and it's anchored then to, from the conical bottom. Well when you're trying to get up your legs go down underneath this thing and it's pretty hard so I was trying to work my way up and they kept pushing my head under the water. You know the guys that were on there were just having right, a good yeah, time yeah. with me. Whew. So they finally let me on and hell I needed to get a rest again because you know, I, I damn near drown with them pushing me around like that. So I'm laying there, and they all got back to the ships. Now I think it's getting dark. I better go back. So I swam back, and I'll be damned if they didn't keep ducking me and ducking me and ducking me, damn near drown me again. So I got out of there, and there was a guy who was saying, duck him, duck him. He was sitting on the, on the uh, railing, so I just shoved him in when I got aboard. <laughs> and, you know, when you hit the... When you hit the water with one of those life jackets on, that life jacket stops and you, yunk, you know, paid him off. Okay. <laughs> tell, us a, tell us about going through the Panama Canal. Do you, well, what kind of an experience they have, is it? They send the Marines aboard, and the Marines want to make sure that you don't do anything to, you know, bomb the canal or do something to block the canal or destroy it in any way. So, um, they're armed with machine guns, and you weren't supposed to do anything. Well, oh, I, I thought, heck, my job is to answer the signal light, so I just went ahead and did it. I didn't say, is this okay? I just went ahead and did it. So it was a false alarm anyway. It, they weren't to us. It was somebody else. So I couldn't tell because they used the A-A-A-A-A-A, which means we're calling you to answer. So that, that's universal. Anybody can answer. So I answered, and then they sent me the N, 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 means negative, no, shut the light off. That was it. That was the only time that there was any problem for me at all. This guy really came to attention, I'll tell you that. He's getting ready to let me have it. <laughs> How long does it take to go through the canal? Well, I'm not... I'm not, not too sure because we spent a lot of time moored out in the lake. And, you know, going through a lock, it doesn't take too long. And uh, it, I, I even forget how many locks there are. I think there's sort of like three on the Atlantic side, and I don't know how many on the Pacific side. Anyway, uh, we got out of there. and on the, You came out on the Atlantic uh, side? Atlantic side. And for some reason, we were anchored on the Atlantic side. I guess it was to make up a convoy. And so some of the guys decided to go swimming again. I thought, to hell with this. I had enough of that for a while. So, so anyway, they were out there. And the captain said, call them men back because there's barracuda that come out this far. They, they all got back right quick. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Nobody got bitten. It was OK. Did you go to shore down there in, in the Panama area? No, no. No. Uh, no. We went from there in the convoy and went over to Italy. And uh, We're out in Italy. That was interesting. Yeah. We, we went to a place called Castellamar de Pompeii. That's all I can remember. So while we were there, there was a little uh, boy about nine years old licking garbage can lids because there wasn't any food and it was devastation and uh, the people there each had a can. Uh, some of them had a can about the size of a Campbell's soup can and some of them had a larger can like a can of tomatoes comes in. And so what we would do is we'd take the garbage, oh terrible, terrible we take the garbage off the ship, a big 55-gallon drum of garbage, 
down there and the cook would take a ladle about that big around about that deep and ladle in there and there's raw chicken skin there's chicken bones all the refuse from the tables uh, coffee grounds just a absolute horrendous garbage mess and the cook used to ladle that out and the people are holding their cans out for this stuff and he'd slop it would get on their hand it was terrible terrible and that little boy was too small to get up there with his can so we took him with us aboard the ship we fed him normal uh, normal meals for a couple of weeks we were there a couple of weeks now we have to leave so we're gonna go back to New York we think and we think we could take the little boy back and I'm sure that we could have put him in a in a uh, bag and smuggled him ashore but uh, we thought after we get him ashore what do we have to do smuggle him back again that's not gonna work and who's gonna take care of him you know we gotta leave we can't get out of the Navy and take care of him so I thought my I couldn't ask my parents to take care of this little boy and I guess everybody else thought the same thing so we put him back ashore and he had to get back to licking garbage can lids I guess mm. Terrible, terrible, terrible. When you were on your way over to um, the Palma, uh, were you escorted uh, by um, any protective cover? You're going across I think, it. I think then we were in an escort. Yeah, we were we were escorted. Yeah. You know, most of the time in uh, the Atlantic, we had an escort. Very seldom did we not. You're still on the Campbell now, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, the uh, 1942 was a time when they called it, the German Navy called it the happy time because they used to be able to come along and sink the ships right along our coastline. Right. And the reason for that is they didn't practice the blackout like they did in Britain. You know, every, everybody had to shut things off. And, and you know, they in New York it's brightly lit and so when the ships go by it's they're silhouetted against the light mm -hmm. and all the way down along the coast it's the same thing wherever they had a coastal city it was light and so the ships that went by there were at great risk and some of them didn't make it and in fact so many guys died in the armed guard service that they were numbered among some of the people who had the greatest casualties. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky. I didn't go in 1942. Mm -hmm. My father saved my life. Yeah. Uh, so the cargo that you brought there to Italy, you unloaded it? Well, what we did was uh, we, we unloaded the cargo, and the way that happened is uh, it's, it's a horrible way they do it. They used prisoners of war, and they were Italian prisoners of war, and they'd be down in the hold, and they had a thing that looked like handles on a plow, but it was fastened to a board maybe about that wide, and about from the floor up to about here, and these handles ha were then had a ring on it that was fastened to a cable that came up through a snatch block and onto the winch, so that somebody could operate that winch and pull that thing through the wheat and what he would do is he would pull it toward the the uh, conveyor and the conveyor was a bucket conveyor so it kept picking up a bucket of stuff and take it over and dump it somewhere I don't know where they dumped it but anyway uh, the conveyor was a leaky thing and the the deck had grain on it that high so I used to go with a guy from um, Los Angeles. That's a bad, bad mistake. You know, the people from Los Angeles march to a different drummer, I'll tell you that. Bad, bad. So anyway, uh, this guy said, let's put these people to work. So we went down in the hold, and, and he said, all right. He said to this guy, come on, you get that shovel and get moving. And the guy pointed the rag around his arm. And the, when you have a rag tied around your arm, it means you're the boss. So he said he was the boss. 
And he said, I didn't give a damn if you're the boss or not, get this thing. And so he was raising hell down there and he got up and he got on that winch and he didn't know how to run it. So he just put the lever down and gave it full steam and that board flew across that doggone thing, you know, down there with all those men. It's a wonder somebody didn't get killed. Mm. Anyway, that was, that was one bad time. And uh, there was another bad time. We used to have a dress blue inspection. And, uh, you know, why would you have dress blue inspection with only 32 guys aboard and some of them are on watch? Ridiculous. Well, I think I figured it out. Our officer was a chicken shit SOB and he was scared to death someone was going to punch him. So he used to read the articles of war. I think they call it the Code of Uniform Justice now. Right. Anyway, the Articles of War said, if you strike an officer, you shall be shot. So he used to read that every time we had the dress blue inspection. So I guess that was the idea. Anyway, this one day we had dress blue inspection, but it was raining and it was windy and snowy and terrible weather. So he said, well, we won't go out in blues, but we'll wear foul weather gear. So everybody put their foul weather gear on and prepare for inspection. So we went out there and we're standing around and heck, we got the hoods on and the big jackets and the big trousers and the sea boots and gloves. And so he, he's walking along, it's ridiculous. Anyway, he's walking along and he came to this guy who had no hat. It's my friend from Los Angeles. What a jerk. So anyway, we're all standing. You've got to stand with your hands on the seams of your trousers. Put your feet like this, your chin up, your chest out, and stand and look ahead, straight like that. So this, this, we're all doing that. And this uh, officer said to him, Sailor, where's your hat? He said, well, sir, it's like this. Right away, he's going, it's like this. I, I'm standing and watch, see? So I'm up there, I need to take a shit. And so I called a petty officer of the watch. I said, you need to relieve me, I need to take a shit. He said, shit in your hat? I did, and I threw it over the side. <laughs> that was it. And we're all doing this. <laughs> <laughs> that's Los Angeles for you. What's that? That's Los Angeles for you. Yeah, huh? that's Los Angeles. <laughs> and the people in New York are screwballs too. <laughs> the only ones that really have it right are the Midwesterners. That's right. Yeah. Did you, did, I'm afraid to ask you, did you go ashore while you were in Italy? There oh, the, yes, the yes. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, I met some woman there. And, I, you know, I was going to buy a, a cameo ring. They make them with lava, and they're quite pretty. And so I thought I'd like to buy one, and I said, may I see this and may I see that? So every time she'd hand me a ring, she'd kind of massage my hand, and I thought, oh, this is getting good. So. <laughs> So I didn't buy a ring, <laughs> so um, I don't even remember her name. I don't even know if I knew her name, but she knew mine, Roberto. She used to call me Roberto. <laughs> anyway, she took me in the back room, and these Italians had two kinds of wine. They had the kind they drank and the kind that everybody else drank, you know, the visitors. Ooh, bad. It was bad. It worked, but it was bad. So. Anyway, I had some good wine. So uh, I went back the next day and went in the back room with her again. And, and those people are screwballs. You know, they don't leave you alone with their women. They, they have to have uh, somebody on the guard and on watch at all times. So I just sat there with a woman and nothing, you know, no good came of that. And so after a few days of that, she said, Hey, Roberto, why don't we get married, eh? I thought, oh no, uh-uh. I said, well, I need to go back to the ship. I'm going to get cigarettes for your father, and then we'll get married. I never went back. <laughs> so that wasn't too exciting. <laughs> what? But, <clears throat> you know, uh, yeah. I, well, I got away. Yeah. So I, I went to shoot. You know, they had the, this rifle where they had little ducks and so forth. And I thought, what the heck, it's just like a, an amusement park, I'll, I'll just try my luck. Heck, you could shoot these BBs, I think they were like 
like square BBs or something. You'd shoot like this and you'd see it go off that way. It was a scam. So anyway, this woman is rubbing my arms, handing me the rifle and rubbing my arms. I thought, oh, okay. So anyway, uh, I looked in the back and they got a whole bunch of young men in the back. And they're all, oh, ha, 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 ha. I thought, yeah, I know. I had, I had a deal to come back later. And I thought, yeah, come back and they're going to mug me and take my money. Forget it. I didn't go back. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, smart. So anyway, uh, I went and saw the old city of Pompeii. And, uh, <clears throat> and that was uh, when they were first excavating it. They probably have a wonderful uh, thing to show people now. But in those days, it was just beginning to be excavated. And there was a guy there who was very industrious. You know, he said, I'll take you through here and show you for a dollar. So each of us gave him a dollar and he gave us a grand tour. Very nice. So uh, what he did is he uh, showed us how you could tell the difference between a two-way street and a one-way street. And the, the uh, one-way street had just two the street would come along and duck, duck down like that so that chariot wheels could fit in there. That's a one-way street. If it had three of those things, that was a two-way street. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, then he showed us the uh, signs. They used to have a pole there, and they had, uh, well, you want me to really tell you everything that they had there on that pole? It's pretty bad. This is Pompeii. Yeah, this very is very decadent society. Yeah, right? well, they used to have this pole, and they would have a man's testicles and his dink stuck on top of the pole. A, a big, big thing, big nuts like that, and a thing about that long. And that's the whorehouse. So he took us in the whorehouse, and you know, all they had there was uh, beds that were about that high, and they were concrete or lava. I don't know went up like that. So that's where they did their thing. I don't know if they put a mat on them or not, but anyway, uh, over the door of each of these little stalls, they had a picture of what you could anticipate sexually in this stall versus this stall versus this stall. They had seven different ways, and mm -hmm. I don't know all the seven, I forget. Anyway, uh, that was the end of that. So, um, you're still on the Campbell. You've, uh, you've yeah. Uh, we went in the Mediterranean. We were we were in the Mediterranean. We stayed there and we uh, operated between uh, North Africa and Italy and uh, Sicily. So um, now you're there in 1944. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And um, 1943 and 44. 44 most more than 43. Mm -hmm. The invasion uh, North Africa was the 8th of November of, of uh, 42 and then the invasion at Sicily was uh, the 10th of July of 43. Well, I didn't get in any of them. And um, then they had Salerno. Right. And uh, I didn't get in that. So but 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 what are you what are you hauling? What, you're picking up uh, cargo and taking it to back to Italy, or sometimes we uh, took soldiers and sometimes we took cargo. And you know, I I don't remember all the cargoes we took, and I just barely remember all this place we went. We went to Algiers and Bone Bizzardi, uh a couple more. I can't even. Remember Did you go names. to Gibraltar? Did you ever well, go? To well, that's called the Pillars of Hercules. You know, right there. What that means is when you're going through Gibraltar, Gibraltar's up here, Africa's over there. You can see them both at the same time. The Pillars of Hercules. Yeah. Now all this time you're still on the uh, on the uh, Campbell. Campbell. Yeah. 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 Um, when you say you're hauling soldiers, what do you mean by that? You're taking them from well, where to where? Well, so take them from North Africa over to Italy, or to Sicily, one or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, 
Um, sometimes we carried other stuff, and I don't remember what all I, what all we carried. I wasn't interested in that. Yeah, I was interested in getting ashore again. Well, did you encounter any any? Uh, oh yes. Being fired on. Oh going? yes, yes, yes. There was many times we had to use smoke pots. Smoke pots are great big things about that big around, and you drop them in the ocean, and they generate huge amounts of smoke. And the ships sail under the smoke, and it's like, like a fog like you never saw before. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we used to get in that, and you know the submarines can't see anything except a bunch of smoke. If they want to, they can fire a torpedo and hope for the best. Right. And they may have, I don't know, but uh, we never got hit. Mm -hmm. So that happened several times. And that time that I was telling you about where the ships went all over the place, that was one of those times, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw Mount Etna. Uh, let's see, Mount Vesuvius and one other mountain. I'm trying to think of the name. Anyway, they were all, uh, they were all uh, erupting at the same time. The sky was pink. And if you went out there without glasses on, you had, you know, pink mud around your eyes from your eyes, trying to wash it out. So, um, were you on board when you saw this? Oh or? yes, heck, I was tied up sometime when I saw it. So, uh, yeah, it looked just like neon signs. There was three places. Stromboli was the other. Etna, Stromboli, and and Vesuvius. Vesuvius. Yeah, Stromboli. all at the same time. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, you know, one night we were out there and it was pitch dark and there was something low in the water that was signaling us. It was signaling uh, V, 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 V. So I was on watch that time with the second mate, which was the 12 to 4. And uh, so we're the only two that saw this. And the helmsman, of course, was, he couldn't see anything. And the guys that were on watch up forward and aft, they might have seen it because it was pretty bright. Anyway, uh, I thought it might have been a, a recognition signal. And if you send the wrong signal, you get blown out of the water. So I said, I said to this second mate, I, I don't dare respond to this because if it's a recognition signal and I do the wrong thing, they're going to shoot us and they can tell who we are. You know, they're low and they see us as a silhouette against the sky, so they know where we are. We don't know who that is or where they are. So we waited around, waited around, and they, and they kept signaling. So he said, well, let's try it. Okay. So we tried it. It was a patrol boat, for heaven's sakes. You know, it was a British patrol boat telling us that we were headed toward uh, Oh, that other island out there, Malta. Well, we knew we were headed toward Malta, but they were telling us so we don't run aground, for goodness sakes. We had people that knew how to keep from doing that. So it was just a big bunch of baloney for nothing. Mm. Yeah. It was peaceful. We didn't know it. You, uh, how long did you stay over there in the uh, Mediterranean theater, so to speak? Well, I think seven months altogether. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, came back to the United States. And uh, where to in the United States? Well, I, we, we came back to New York. And that's when they asked us, who wants to go back to Treasure Island and who wants to stay here? I thought, you know, I've been sure in New York. It's a, it's a really wild town. I want to stay here. It was the best thing I ever did. So I stayed in New York at the Brooklyn Armed Guard Center. Anyway, uh, from there I had the other two ships, the Sachem and, and the uh, Johnny Schmelzer. So that was interesting. You know, all we ever did was just take gasoline over to the UK and uh, let's see, we went to uh, uh, the southern ports. We were in Southampton once, I don't even know why, but we were in Southampton and 
and we were in uh, Bristol, and there's one other place that I think was Wales, Swansea. That's it, Swansea. So I had a girlfriend in Swansea. That was nice. And uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, I tell you, I had a good time. That's a <laughs> oh, a good time. That's what they say about the Navy. They had a girl in every port. I didn't have one in every port. Almost. No, no. Well, <laughs> yeah, I did well. I'll have to say that. <laughs> in fact, I enjoyed myself immensely. So, what type of ship uh, were those, these next to the? Um, you just named them the Smelter and the Sachem. The, the Sachem. Sachem. What Sachem is Sachem was named after an Indian tribe in Massachusetts. Right. And uh, the Sachem was a T2 tanker that was much more luxurious than the ship I just got off. You know the the. Uh, Oh, Liberty ships were, they were okay, but there was no luxury, believe me. The T2 tankers were beautiful, wonderful. So anyway... Uh, and you're carrying nothing but fuel. To no, high-octane gasoline. Uh, one tw one it, twenty. It was always high-octane uh, yeah. gasoline. For aviation, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. And uh, anyway, um, I was going to tell you about well, yeah, we were tied up in New York, and uh, we noticed there was another tanker that was uh, tied up in, well, they weren't tied up, they were in dry dock. So uh, my friend, this is another friend of mine from New York. You know, the New York friends and the Los Angeles friends, you need to jettison them if you, uh, you want to stay out of trouble. But anyway, he said, Let's, let's go over and see if we can steal something off of that tanker, make our place more amenable. I said, well, okay. So we went over there and we didn't even have any tools, so there's no way to <laughs> unfasten anything. So we're looking around and some guy came along and he said, we were in one of the closets there and there was a bunch of signal flags in that closet. And he said, uh, what are you guys doing here? I said, what are we doing here? Take me to the guy that runs this place. I want to talk to him. There's stuff missing in here. I did that. I didn't even, boy, just smart. Anyway, he took me to his leader. So uh, right away I chewed him out. I said, what, what the hell are you running on this ship anyway? We went and looked. We saw the signal flags in there, and there were two signal searchlights. What the hell happened to them? He said, I don't know. I said, well, by God, we're from the port director's office. And we're taking those flags with us before they go missing. He said, take them, take them. So we stole the flags, got them back on the ship, and we, we opened them up. And my God, my flags are like this, that size, and these flags are that size. I, oh, I said to the guy, you know, we, we can't use these things. That would not be right. He said, well, we'll have to take them back. I said, take them back, hell. We're not taking them back. We threw them over the side. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go to jail for this, am I? No. <laughs> How many trips did you make uh, on the T2 tanker? Then, it was back six, in, I believe. Six. Over, over to uh, England? Oh, yeah. Was, no. <clears throat> yeah, and one time, you know, we used to spend two days over there unloading and three days in the States, and two days in England, three days in the States. So I wanted to have five days, you know, sometime in New York, because I really like New York. So I traded with a guy. He could have my two days in England, and I'd get his three days in, in New York. So, boy, I had a wonderful time. I had five whole days and $500. And I went ashore. And I used to come back to my bunk at night. I don't even know how I made it back. I used to get drunk every day. And, and I'd come back, and I, the edge of my bunk would be there, and my back would be down on it like this, and my legs out here, and my head way back. And I'd have to grab my hair when I had hair and pull it up like this because I couldn't raise my neck. It was cramped. So I'd get up, get dressed up, shower, and shave, and brush my uniform off and fix myself up, shine my shoes if necessary, and go out and do it again. So anyway, it was a wonderful five days, and I wound up broke. I don't know if anybody just stole the money from me or if I spent it, 
but I, I had a good time, so I didn't care. And anyway, they finally woke me up and said, you're on watch. And I had the DTs. Did you ever have the DTs? No. That's horrible. I mean, you can't stand still. I thought, oh my God, I can't. Jesus. And some guy said, come with me, I'll fix you up. He gave me a couple of shots of liquor and just calmed me right down. It was great. You know, I was back to normal. <laughs> I enjoyed that. So uh, I can't even relate what I did. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, how long did you stay on that uh, sachem? Sachem. The sachem. 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 Yeah. Well, it was about six months. And then did you go on the uh, smelter? Yeah. Yeah. No. I'll tell you how I got on that. <clears throat> it was by accident. Anyway. Um, let's see. Uh, our officer, uh, his name was Gagnon. He was a lieutenant. And he used to give everybody days, lots of days off, you know, in New York. He never gave me any days off. He used to give me, you know, like a, a day, and I had to come back. I, I said to him one time, how come everybody else gets to have three days off and I only get one day off? He said, you live too far inland. We're afraid you'll go in there and you won't get back in time. I thought, that's a hell of an excuse. And especially since one of the guys that lived in Detroit got a three-day pass or a three-day liberty. So my brother-in-law, the guy Frank Rowe, went and he got some forms and he filled them out to give me a three-day liberty and he, he uh, forged the officer's name and so forth. And, and he had this typewriter so screwed up, uh, it's a wonder that it Pass muster. Anyway, you know, part of it's on this line, and then it would jump up, and p part of it would be over there, and oh my, it was awful. So anyway, I thought uh, I need it, so I um, went, got, I left, and it was before I was supposed to leave. I'm on the train, and the shore patrol is coming along, and we'd already made friends with the girls from from the from the college that were going home, and I said, well, I guess I'm scheduled for the brig because my, my papers were not dated. They, they were dated okay, but the time was wrong or something. So I thought, man, they had to catch me before I got normal here or something. So the girl said, no, no, it's okay. You go in the ladies' room here and we'll stand guard. And when they go by, we'll tap, tap on the door and you can come back out. So I did that and I got away from the shore patrol. So anyway, uh, we, we uh, finally came to Detroit and I hunched down real low because I didn't want to have any dealings with the shore patrol and they were standing at the top of a, of a big ramp. All the passengers were coming up. It was wartime, there was a bunch of passengers. So I just got down low and came along with, in a whole crowd. I just got right by them. <laughs> so anyway, my brother-in-law sent me a, a telegram and he said, uh, we're going to uh, Australia and uh, you're going to miss the ship, so anyway, you, you better report to the armed guard station. I thought, oh, for goodness sakes, I'm going to go and get in the brig, sure as hell. So I went back and this guy was with me and he kept saying, yeah, kid, you could do this time stand on your head. I said, well, I don't want to go to the brig. He said, yeah, don't, don't worry about it, you'll be okay. So we got back. He went to the ship. Nobody sent him any message. He went to the ship and he reported back late. That's not good. I reported on time and handed this bogus bunch of papers to the ensign there. And he looked at him. He said, okay. He said, pick up your gear and go to building you. And I thought, oh, I guess they're going to trust me to go to the brig. So I picked up my gear and I'm waiting for somebody to escort me. And he says, well, you can go. I said, okay. So I went out. I remember I got to salute the flag. It was a, I always loved to do that. And after that, I went to Billy U and it wasn't the brig. It was uh, the outgoing unit. I thought, boy, this is good. So I volunteered to get out. And some guy said, you don't need to go. You, you can stay in New York and you, you can have several days liberty here. I said, yeah, I like it at, sh at sea. And the reason I like it at sea is because I wanted to get away before they smartened up over there and put me in the brig. So that's how I got on the Schmelzer. <laughs> they said, 
what kind of ship do you want to go on? I said, the next one going out. <laughs> so, so, so now you're on the smelter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, where you go your first uh, well departure? You know, I have a hell of a time remembering all that. The smelter. Let's see. You haven't done so bad so far. Well, I know that we uh, we went to France and Belgium and Germany. And Hall, England, I know that. That's all I remember. And uh, What are you carrying on this mouth, sir? Well, I don't even remember that, but it was something they needed, I'm sure of that. <laughs> but I don't know. Anyway, I was anxious to get ashore again. So we got to Hall, England, and uh, I made friends with a dock worker, and uh, they, they had a dearth of chocolate there. Well, I had a whole box of chocolate. So I was making friends when I gave him a candy bar, and, and he said, I'd like to have you come home with me. And I said, okay, and I went home with him, and, and his wife stood there with a saucer that had a biscuit on it, and a saucer that had a cup of tea on it. And she stood there and held it while he drank his tea, ate his biscuit, and his little, two little kids were there. They reminded me of Mary Poppins people. They, well, Mary Poppins, you know, sweet little children. And so I gave him the box of chocolate, and I don't know if the children got any of it or not. But anyway, uh, he and I went out to the pub. He said, well, love, I'm off to the pub. And so here the, the woman is at the bottom of the totem pole over there, you know. They're, all they are is the cook, housekeeper, uh, well, lover, and uh, child, child watcher. You know, that's, that's their lot in life. Where was this at? This was in Hull, England, very near Scotland. Okay. And uh, anyway, uh, we, we went to a pub, and so we're getting ready to leave, and he said, we can't leave with these glasses. I said, who's going to stop us? Come on, we'll just, I have some of that east and west coast tattooed all over me. I got rid of that. Anyway, we went out, and there was a bobby there. So we finished drinking our beer and took the glasses back inside. <laughs> These bobbies are big men, big. <laughs> they have to be because they have to do it with no weapons, you know, just a stick. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we went to France and we didn't get off the ship there. We did something at Cherbourg, and I don't even remember what the hell it was. Then we went to. Uh, uh, Bremerhaven, Germany, and uh, that was quite a trip. You know, we sailed up through the uh, Baltic Sea, I guess it was, and came down, and, and there's, there was a huge current in there, and we had to make a turn, and boy, I, I didn't know. You know, they had a pilot there that really knew how to do that, and so he turned long before he was supposed to, uh, in my essence, or my thoughts anyway, but the current carried us right around, so it was just okay. He knew what he was doing. I thought we were never going to make it. Anyway, uh, we, we went through a bunch of canals in there, and I remember uh, just standing on the bridge and uh, looking, just lazily looking at the farmland. We were in a canal that was about wide enough for two ships to pass with a decent amount of space between them. And there was a farmhouse out there, there was nothing else around for miles. And a buzz bomb came over, one of the V1s. And the V1s were things that were launched off a, uh, a concrete pad, and they would continue to run until they ran out of fuel. When they ran out of fuel, they'd come down and bomb something. So the idea is give them enough fuel to get where you want them to bomb something. Anyway. There was nothing for miles around except this little farmhouse. That darn thing came down and bombed that farmhouse. I couldn't believe it. So a, a buzz bomb actually destroyed a building in Germany. Yeah, we, we, were, we were in Germany and still, wait a minute, I must have that wrong. We, yeah, we were, we were in Belgium then, Belgium. Yeah, um, we weren't in Germany yet. Yeah. And yeah. so the thing came down and bombed that 
bombed that house and some woman came running out. She was the only one that ran out. I don't know what happened to her family. Mm. Another time a buzz bomb came and I was looking right straight at it. I thought this is it. I just opened my mouth. I was, I thought there's no need to try to get away. It's coming right straight for us. And so at the last moment it just turned like this and bombed the side of the canal and didn't hit us. That's a canal in Belgium. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another time one of them flew between a couple of the masts and uh, you know I saw that and I didn't have time to get scared. It was gone but somebody else must have been looking at it first and he reached in his pocket for his cigarettes and he said, did you see that? <laughs> yeah. <Good job. laughs> anyway, that's that was the worst. So, um, yeah, we went to Germany and we played the, the officers. Football. Football were the officers against the enlisted men. Where at in Germany? Bremerhaven. Oh, it, right there. That's a port, isn't it? Yeah, yes. In the and we played them for two days. We didn't keep score. All we wanted to do is just hurt somebody. So they, they wanted to hurt somebody too, you know. That's a good excuse. So we just hit each other really good. And, and we were young men, so no bones were broken. When is this about when, you, when you're playing this football game? The month and year, would you say? The month and year when we played football? Mm -hmm. Well, that was uh, probably around October of 45. Okay, so when you're there playing football, the war is over in Europe. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, VE Day I was at sea and VJ Day I was at sea again. I used to admire that guy on Life Magazine that grabbed the nurse. I used to think, man, I wish I could have done that too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after you finish, after you've had your football game, then continue with your service, if you will. Well, we just, we just came back to the States and I, I got to leave and uh, so I think it started uh, uh, at Halloween or something like that, Halloween and so I had a month off. Then I went to uh, Great Lakes again to get discharged and I got discharged on the 8th of December. So I came home and I took my bride back to her home. Now, we haven't covered your bride yet. Oh. Okay. Um, and I think this all started because of a, a shipmate or something by the name of Rowe well, or something? my shipmate was Frank Rowe. You have his information there. Right. And uh, anyway. What uh, ship w was, it, was he on? That, was, that was the uh, tanker. tanker. The tanker. Oh, the A the uh, A two. So no, it was a T T two tanker. Sachem Sachem. Yeah, the Sachem. Yes. I keep pronouncing it wrong. That's okay. The uh, Sachem. Uh, you met uh, uh, well, Mr. Rowe on yeah, the uh, yes, Sachem. Yes. And uh, and his best man York. You know, I used to wonder why the hell he was the best man. He his uniform always used to have woolies all over it. And never shined his shoes. Yeah, I never want to go ashore with him. He'd scare everybody away. It was worthwhile. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, he got better. He got married, and his wife straightened him out. Right. You know, he used to look pretty good after his wife got working on him. <laughs> so, let's get back to uh, your shipmate, Ro. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, anyway, it, he explains it in there uh, on page 10 when he first met me, you know. Yeah. We were at sea and uh, we were in a hurricane and uh, it was a really bad hurricane. So we were on the bridge and we came down on the lee side of the bridge and there were four of us and my brother-in-law was leading and I was following and two guys were behind me and we're walking along this, this uh, deck house and the wind is blowing this way and so we're in the lee, of course, he stepped out there and it just knocked him right on his duff and he slid right over to the doggone uh, side of the ship. I thought he was going to be gone. We were on the boat deck. 
and somehow he got stopped and I think that he he had his feet like this and they hit that four inch high scupper plate and that kept him from going over the side but now he's held down by the wind there's no way that he can get up it's terrible strong wind so I got out there but I didn't get blown down because I knew what was going to happen, so I got down real low and let myself slide over to the life jacket box, got my feet in the life jacket box, and I got a hold of him and pulled him back, and, and that, was, that was it. So, you know, he, he probably saved himself, but he always said that I saved his life. I don't know. I don't know. So you guys made friends? Oh, yeah. And what did he do, decide to take you home one day or something? No, or? he never took me home. You know, what it was is we had a falling out on the ship. They decided, they decided to have fun with me. The, there was the radio man and two gunners, Frank and Andrioli, Robert Andrioli. Anyway, they, they decided to have fun, so they used to s stay in there and they say, shh, shh, here he comes, here he comes. And that's just to get me on edge. And then they say, uh, um, well, um, why don't you get off this ship? And I say, well, why, why should I? They said, you know. I said, no, I'm afraid I don't know. So this went on for about a week or so, and I'm beginning to get kind of fed up with this stuff. And I'm beginning to get the idea of what they're aiming at. And what they're trying to do is uh, pretend that I'm queer. So I'm waiting for somebody to make a mistake. They wouldn't make a mistake. so. Every time I go to Chow, I'd sit up against the bulkhead in one of the seats and in in on, a, on a tanker, the other seats swivel like this. It's really nice. So uh, I was there and the other two guys would sit across the table from me and one guy would sit behind me at the next table and they would all work me over during lunchtime. So I turned my chair around and I faced this guy from Detroit Robert Andrioli, and I said, well, you guys been bullshitting here for about a week or so, and, you know, I'm at a loss. I have no idea what you're talking about. What in the world are you talking about? He said, well, oh, I'll tell you. He said something like queer. I leaped out of the chair, grabbed him by the throat, and I treated him like a rag doll. I mean, I had him up and I was going to punch him, but I didn't have time to hurt him. So I just thrust him back in the seat. My feet came off the ground. Up, down, up, down. He was like that. So the guys pulled me off. And so I sat down. <clears throat> I said, and that goes for you two sons of bitches, too. You got that? That was the end of that. So they used to call me Deadly Headley. <laughs> <laughs> Deadly Headley. So how did you get to meet your wife? Well, you know, um, I thought, well, I, I got on the Schmelzer, and I thought, well, I'll uh, stop off, you know, and, and see my friend Frank. You know, I got friendly with him again after I called him a son of a bitch, but anyway, it's okay. So anyway, uh, he wasn't home, but his mother was there, and and she was a Scottish woman, and she was very kind to me, always kind. She said, you can stay for supper. She said, Frank's father would like to talk to you. So anyway, they talked to me, and they played the bagpipes for me. I've never heard them before, and I thought, the police are coming for sure. And anyway, uh, the old man and his son, his oldest son, took me to the bar room, and we had a few drinks, and, and we came back, and then... The son left, went to his house, and the father and mother went to bed, and I'm there with, uh, with Frank's sister. So we uh, didn't go to bed till 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, we were busy mugging each other, and that was pretty good. So anyway, uh, I uh, got up in the morning, and I shook hands with her on the way out. I didn't dare, I didn't dare kiss her because I thought maybe the old man, man won't like that. So anyway, I came back, and the fourth time I came back, we got married. I hardly saw that woman, but we got married. And uh, what's her what's her name? Allison Lynn. Allison Lynn. Yeah. 
named after her grandmother, Allison Lynn Galloway. I have a daughter named Allison Lynn, as well as a wife. Well, my wife's dead. Okay. Well, uh, when did you get married to date? Do you recall? July the 8th, um, 1945. 1945. Where'd you get married at? We got married in uh, the uh, Methodist Rectory. In what city was that? That was in Lynn, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And my father didn't want me to get married because he said, I need to talk to you before you get married. And I just wrote to him and said, well, Dad, I think it's too late for talk. I need to get married. And I did. So he, he sent me his, he said, go ahead. I had to get his permission. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Permission. I can't believe I had Well, you were permit. still in the Navy, though. Yeah, I was. You had to get permission to get married from the Navy. Well, I didn't get any permission from the Navy. I just got married. Okay. <laughs> I see. Uh, I used to s write my own ticket, pretty much. I, I know. I, <clears throat> I understand that. Um, so y y you, um, you go back to your ship, and your wife stays at uh, home with her parents. That's right. And, yep. Uh, the only thing different is I got less money. I got sent her fifty, the fifty dollar allotment. Yeah. <laughs> that was a real sacrifice in your. Well, what the heck? <laughs> that was my my lady love. <laughs> That's right. The love of my life. Yeah. So you got uh, d you get discharged on the eighth of December then. Yeah. Nineteen forty-five. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, where do you and your wife uh, do you stay in Lynn, Massachusetts, or do you go? Well. We visited my parents because they live in Detroit, and that's on the way between Massachusetts and the place I got discharged. So we went back then to uh, to uh, her place in December, you know, right around Christmas time, and stayed there for four and a half years, and then came to Ohio, and we've been here ever since. Well, did you come to Cincinnati? Yeah, uh, that was for a job. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Where'd you go to work at then? Well, I, I went to work as a draftsman for General Electric Company. Uh, in Evendale? In, no, no, in uh, Massachusetts. And then I, I met a man there, the one most wonderful boss I ever had in my life. His name was Jack Gibbons. So he got a job out here, and he was uh, uh, second in command out here at... Uh, General Electric Company, and he asked me if I'd like to come out and see him, and I got fired when that happened. I was working for Stone and Webster. That's a big engineering company in, uh, in Massachusetts, and he called me, and he said, uh, I can uh, promise you so much money, and I think it was, oh, I don't remember anymore. Anyway, it was better than I was getting. I was getting 80 bucks a week then, and uh, so I thought, what the heck? Yeah, it was 90 bucks a week. That was it. And I got two raises the next year in a row, you know, two raises. So I was a crown prince. Do you know what a crown prince is? No. A crown prince is one of the people that doesn't know shit but is protected by one of the higher-ups, and he can do no wrong. He's being trained. Trained. I was being trained, and I didn't know I was being trained. I thought I was so smart that I made it already. You know, yeah. stupid boy. So what year did you, when did you go to work for General Electric? Well, you, I went uh, to work for them, the uh, I think it was uh, 1951. 1951, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that is a General Electric. Yeah, and yeah. You're, and you're, where are you living at this time? Well, I went to work for General Electric the first time in 1946. You know, when I lived back in Massachusetts, and then when my mentor got a job over here, Jack Gibbons, he hired me to come and work for them uh, in 1951, mm -hmm. October of 1951. Okay. And it was wonderful. I had my three-piece suit on and a heavy overcoat and a hat and gloves, and I came here. It was beautiful, beautiful weather. It was October. It was, it was Columbus Day. October the 12th, and I, I had to strip that coat off before I died of the heat. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. So I stayed here for
for about a week with a friend of mine because my boss said, we can't afford to keep you in a hotel, so you need to find a place to go. And so this guy said, well, you can come home with me. My wife wants to look you over, and if she checks you out okay, then you can stay. So I stayed for about a week, and then I got my own place. That was it. What was your uh, job, your position or job? or at? Uh, I was drafting supervisor. I see. Yeah, you know, I didn't know crap from apple butter about being a supervisor. You know, I told you I was a crown prince. And, uh, you know, the crown prince can do no wrong. He can screw up something fierce, but he doesn't get fired because his mentor saves him. Was that the time of Herman the German out there? Oh, yes. Yo, I knew him. Did you? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I'll say. Okay. I knew him back in Massachusetts. He That's used to right. holler at those That's people. Right. He was in Manhattan. Holler at those people. It was awful. Yeah. They, he was in charge of test engineers. Right. Boy, I'll tell you, they were tested in the fire by Herman. <laughs> yes. Um, so did you stay at General Electric for your entire career? Or? Well, no. No, I uh, worked for myself for a while. and I... Uh, worked as a hired hand for a few people, you know, job shopping, they call it, and uh, that was about it, you know. Did your wife work? Well, I didn't want her to work. Uh, I told your wife was a piano? My wife was 16 when I met her. Ah. She was 16 when I married her. She used to work for uh, Champion Lamp, and uh, I told her, you got to quit that job. I went with her to quit it in case anybody gave her flack. Anyway, nobody gave her flack. So it was all a happy happiness and light. And I wanted her to quit because I wanted somebody to take care of our children. And I thought that, that I'm supposed to earn the money. She's not. I earn the money. She takes care of the house and watches over the children to make sure they get brought up the way we want them brought up. Right. And how many children did you have? Five. Five? What Five are, girls. What are their names? Well, let's see. There was Virginia Ann, uh, Linda Kay, Susan Carroll, Sandra Jean, and Allison Lynn. Yes, after your wife. Yeah. And, or, yeah. yeah, and we had another male in the house. He was a dog. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dog? He's the only other male. Yeah. <laughs> I can... <laughs> Knowing your reputation now, I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you take that the right way. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, so w when did you uh, retire then, so to speak? When did I retire? Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, uh, about 1985, 86, yeah. something like that. But then I got a job. You know, I worked for different people and got another job and the last one I had was 1994 mm. so that and was that was okay and when did your wife die you said your wife had passed away uh, 2013 right at Thanksgiving uh -huh. the day before Thanksgiving I, I hate Thanksgiving yeah. yeah I like Thanksgiving for what it means and for all the people that I have around me and that I can be around that's never gonna go away Right. Like my son-in-law, he is one of my stars, you know, he's one of many stars. All my sons-in-laws are wonderful, wonderful men. And uh, so that's all I can say is that as far as I'm concerned, they're just like my sons. Well, they're privileged to have you as a father-in-law. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I meet a lot of people doing these interviews and I can tell you uh, usually we're getting close to the end of our interview and I Brian do you have any questions today I, I just have a couple uh, you said at the beginning of the interview that you were afraid you might go in the army and you really wanted to be in the Navy why why did you want to be <coughs> in the Navy well I had an uncle that was in the Navy and he used to tell me if you like a warm bed three meals a day and get warm once in a while, you better join the Navy. He said, otherwise you're going to live in a hole. Whew, I, that was enough for me. You know, I, I was almost thinking of joining the Army, though, because they had brown shoes. You know, I thought brown shoes were better than white shoes, black shoes. 
I didn't. Can you imagine that? That no. would have been terrible. <laughs> you sound like you had a good relationship with your father. Did you keep? Oh, in touch my with him? father was a first-class man. Did you were you able to keep in touch with him when you were in service? Well. Yes, I used to write letters when I was in the service. When I got married, my wife was my social secretary. <laughs> she used to do the writing. But you know, my father always treated my mother top notch. And she didn't deserve some of that. You know, she used to lie to him and do things she shouldn't be doing. Nothing, nothing that was against the marriage necessarily, but, but she would uh, do things that she shouldn't do. Just, uh, well, I'll give you an example. She went to visit her relatives in uh, West Virginia. In fact, they were my father's relatives. And she wanted to show everybody a good time, so she called my father on the phone and told him that, that she needed money because his mother was deathly sick. So he sent her money. And she spent the money whining and dining the people. And when she got home, my dad said, uh, Mother, you, you look pretty well. Uh, how, how did you get well so quick? You were deathly sick, I understand. She said, I wasn't sick. That's when my father found out that my mother was a bull crapper. <clears throat> you're, you're, were your parents from West Virginia? No, my father was from West Virginia. Okay. How did you end up in the Detroit area? My mother was from northern Michigan. Okay. And what happened is my father had a storied childhood, I'll tell you. Anyway, they went from, because of his mother, she had three husbands, and they kept dying on her. So the first guy was a Baptist minister, and his name was uh, Leroy Hampson Headley. Hence, my name is Robert Leroy. And uh, so then the next husband of hers was a, a guy named Amos Courtney. Amos Courtney was a, a foreman on the Erie Barge Canal. So the family moved to New York, and they just kept following the Barge Canal. They lived in many, pl many places along the Barge Canal. So, you know, you'd live here and then work on the canal, and it went by. So now you move to the next town, and you work and so forth. So anyway, my uncle, who was a, a top dog on the crew of the Erie's Barge Canal, went to Michigan for some reason, and he found a job as a welder in the Fenestra Window Company. Fenestra is a very fine company. And so he called my father and he said, you know, you ought to quit that job out there and come to Detroit, and we'll uh, both work in the Fenestra Company. So my father did, and uh, he also became a fireman on a riverboat in, <laughs> in Detroit. <laughs> and Besides that, he was, he met my mother downtown because he lived downtown, and that's, I told you, right. how, how they got together. What did your brother do? He, did he join the service, or what did he do during the war after you joined that time period? What, what did who do? Your brother. My brother. Well, my brother was a year and nine months younger than I was, and he joined the Army, and uh, he was a paratrooper. And he decided to hell with this. I don't like jumping out of airplanes, so he gave that up. And uh, they put him in some other thing, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't quite as hazardous as jumping out of airplanes. Anyway, he got out of there, and he, he left high school, too, to join the Army. And so he got out, and he was going to the uh, Highland Park High School, where they think their snot doesn't stink or something. You know, there's a bunch of bunch of people that believe they've arrived and they have not arrived. They are maybe a little bit more uh, wealthy than the general population, but nothing to write home about. But they really think they're something. So this, uh, this uh, minister, the, the principal said to my brother, well, Mr. Headley, uh, we're going to make it easy for you to get your GED. He said, don't make it easy on me. You can just make it the same for me as you make it for everybody else. So he did get a GED. So did I. Uh, yeah, um, I was just wondering about when you were crossing, did you have, I mean, you were talking about that year where you 
boats were pretty pretty bad. But when you were crossing, what, what were there procedures? Would you run into sub? Would you go into a certain uh, procedure uh, if you had a sub site? It was sort of like catch as catch can. There was no procedures, no written procedures, no plans or anything. We just used to go out there and hope for the best. Did you have encounters? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So what would you do? Well, <laughs> where would you go? I'd stay at my battle station. My battle station was a loader on a 20 millimeter, and it was on the bridge. And the picture that I have of myself is right next to my battle station on the wing of the bridge. So anyway, uh, that was what I did. I'm going to tell you about another couple things, though, if I may. I don't want to elongate no. this too much. No, no. We're <clears throat> that's why we, we were in the Mediterranean, and it was heavy, heavy fog. And uh, so once in a while, we'd, y you know, in a convoy, the first row, the first ship is called number 1-1, one, 1-1. One, one one. That means they're in the first row, the first ship. Then this ship would be 1-2. One, three, one, four. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the number back this way. So anyway, we were something like five, six, something like that. And I'm standing on the port side of the bridge, which is not normal for me. I used to span, stand on the, star, uh, I mean, I'm standing on the starboard side. I used to stand on the port side most of the time. Anyway, I was looking out there into the fog, just lazily looking, and I saw the bow of the ship heading straight for us out of the fog. So it was, it was going to be a collision, there's no doubt about it. So the uh, first mate was on watch, we were on the four to eight watch, and I said, Mr. Leak, and just pointed, and he ran and grabbed the helm and threw him off, and he said, take the wheel. And I went up and I said, what course? He said, steady as she goes. He'd already cranked it around a couple of times. The steam steering gear, man, you've got to give it this if you want that ship to move. So anyway, I steered and we avoided that. That other ship came right alongside of us. Mm. Boy, he turned that thing just in time and I think they might have taken some evasive action too. But anyway, I never said anything more about it. He never said any more about it. And I think he had to tell the captain, you know, that's stuff for the log of the ship. Anyway, the captain knew about it. And I don't know if anybody else ever knew. I never told anybody. But, man, we're all lucky. In the fog, we wouldn't have made it. Yeah. So that was one time. I'm going to tell you, what? Yeah, you have another one. I have one more. Yeah, Good. This, this has to do with uh, my wildness. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I was restricted for some stupid reason. I don't know. I don't know what it was. They took my ID card, and here I am. I have to muster three or four or five times a day. I don't remember. It was a terrible number of times. They give me a broom and I have to sweep this great big corridor. And there was a bunch of us that used to do it. As soon as that guy would go away, I'd lean the broom against the wall and I'd leave. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, I, I had this friend that said to me, I'm, I'm on shore patrol duty. Um, would you take shore patrol duty for me? And I said, I can't. He said, why? I said, I'm restricted, and besides, I'm not a rated man. I was just a seaman first class. He, and you have to be a rated man to be a shore patrolman, at least signalman third or something like that, at least. So anyway, I wasn't, and he said, well, he said, borrow his ID card. You can have my jumper, and I'll take your jumper, and, and uh, everything will be okay. I said, okay. Man, this is not good because his name was some Polish name, <laughs> like about five syllables long, and I still don't know it to this day. Anyway, I had his ID card on my chain, and so I met the guy that I'm supposed to do, I, uh, do shore patrol work with me, and he said, what's your name? And I'm, <laughs> I don't know my name, and I have to get away and read my name, and I said, Wajah Haja Hoji, whatever the hell it was. So. Anyway, we're standing in line and we're getting mustered, and they called my name, and I don't even hear it. <coughs> he said, that, "That's you. Oh, oh, here, here." So they put us on a truck and took us from Treasure Island to 
San Francisco, and we went to the shore patrol station. So in here, you, go, you have your own leggings and your own uniform, but they give you a belt, and a, an armband, and a club. So you have to give them your ID card. So I take my Polish ID card and throw it in the cigar box. I got my stuff. We went out and we started doing our uh, shore patrol work. So this guy said, you know, the guys used to like to roll their sleeves up, you know. And he said, here come some guys with their sleeves rolled up. Let's tell them to roll them down. I said, for God's sakes, you, got, you like to roll your sleeves up. Leave these people alone. Let's save it for something worthwhile. He said, okay. I just didn't want to have any problems with anybody. Right. So at 8 o'clock, we were supposed to go to a dance and, you know, make sure nothing went wrong with the sailors at this dance. And after the dance, we would report back to the uh, shore patrol station. So anyway, the dance was going pretty good. And this young, sweet thing came over and she said, do you want to dance? And, oh, 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 gee. I really wanted to dance really bad, but, but I said, I can't, I have this badge. She said, take it off. No, <laughs> no, 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 I can't, can't do that. So anyway, I had to forego that. And some guy came over to me <laughs> half, about halfway through the dance and he said, can I say what he said? <laughs> Go ahead, yes. He said, there's a guy over there with a big falcon knife like that. I said, stay away from him. So anyway, it came time to rid this place of the people. So I said to my guy, you stand by the door and don't let anybody in and I'll run them all out. He said, it sounds like a plan or something like that. So anyway, I went through there and I said, come on guys, let's go, let's go. And there were two guys that just got out of the brig, I could tell from their haircuts. So I said, um, come on guys, let's go. And they said, bag your ass or something like that. And I just grabbed this one guy by the shirt. And I said, I'm going to work you over, buddy. You better get off that dance right now and get moving. I wasn't going to touch him. I was afraid that I, I don't need any altercations with anybody. I just want to maintain a little profile. He got up and dutifully left. Good. So we went back to the shore patrol station. Now i got to retrieve my, my ID card. Right. I don't know my name. So I'm standing out there, and, uh, and all the guys were on the truck, and they're saying, get in there, get in there. I thought, well, what the hell, I'm the last one, I'm going to have to confess. So I went in, and I'm just about ready to tell the chief that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to go to the brig. And he said, this must be your card. And I looked, I said, it is, thank you very much. And <laughs> it was the last one, thank goodness. <laughs> So I got on the truck, we went back, and I went, it was about two o'clock in the morning when we got back. I don't know why it was so late, but it was about two, and so I went into the barracks, and this guy whose ID card I borrowed said, um, mm. and he said, give me my ID card, and he said, take that jumper off, they're looking for you. So I took the jumper off because it had a raid on it. Oh man, I don't want to be caught with that. So I took my shoes off and got in bed. So um, it, was, it wasn't long till they were taking a foxtail brush and beating on my bunk, waking me up. And one guy, he was a first class petty officer, he said, um, you went ashore, didn't you? I said, no, I did not. And he said, well, you didn't muster. I said, well, I know I didn't muster. He said, why not? I said, well, I know I should have mustered, but I went over and I got in a chow line and it came time to muster, so I think to myself, hell, I'm hungry. Do I want to eat or do I want to muster? I thought, to hell, eating comes first. So I went and had something to eat. And he said, yeah, and then what happened after that? He said, there was more musters. Where, where were you? I said, I went to the movies. I thought, as long as I miss one muster, hell, I might as well get shot for a sheep as a goat or a goat as a sheep. So I went to the movies. And he said, well, then what happened? He said, we were looking for you. I said, well, I came out, it was such a nice night that I sat down on the bench and I fell asleep. And I woke up, it was early in the morning and I was cold, so I got in bed with all my clothes on except I saved my jumper. 
I took my jumper off and I just got in bed. I was cold. So he believed it because I had my uniform on except for the jumper. So anyway, um, I, I think I was doing pretty well with that. And so this guy who's, who I borrowed the ID card from was over there listening at the Master at Arms shack and they were kicking it around what I'd done and, and uh, they, they said, well, I guess he's right, you know, he came up with the right thing. And I even told him what the movie was about because I'd seen it once before. So anyway, I got, a, uh, I got on a ship and uh, left. That was on the, the William W. Campbell. And uh, so we came back to San Francisco and I went over and saw those guys and I said, you remember the time that you thought I went ashore? And they said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I did. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I just have one last question. Um, did you work a lot with the Merchant Marine in Vietnam? Oh, yeah. The Merchant Marine ran the ship, mm -hmm. and the armed guard took care of the signaling, uh, you know, visual and, and radio signaling, and the gunnery. That was the difference. We had two different mess rooms. And I think it's just in recent years that Merchant Marines have been considered better. Than well, we used to think the Merchant Marines were, uh, well, taking advantage of the government. You know, they were getting paid something like $5 a day to be in a war zone. Man, they were making money hand over fist. And we're doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, we're not getting any extra money. We're getting. 20% C pay, but um, you know, I used to think that um, they were seagoing civilians, that's all. And they were, but you know, they were still running the same risks that we were, but they were getting paid a heck of a lot more for it. So there wasn't much fragmentation between the two? Well, you got so you liked them anyway. <laughs> yeah. As long as you didn't talk about pay. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, well, we used to meet at uh, the same bar room all the time, all of us. It was called Jack Lewis's on 49th Street. And we used to have a really good time in there. And you know, you buy a round, you could drink all night long on the rest of them then. So sometimes if you bought a round, uh, you had to hang around to get paid back. <laughs> uh, do you guys have any questions you want to ask? Uh, yeah, Dad, I just a couple. Um, we talked about it on the way down. We uh, talked about being on watch with the Japanese uh, submarines and stuff in the German U boats. Well, did you, didn't, did you actually? I didn't any see that. I didn't. Launches? I didn't see that. Okay. I just heard Frank about that. Did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pat wanted to ask. Well, what did they learn? Oh yeah. What did What did Frank tell you? What did Frank tell me? Yeah. His His uh, witnessing. He didn't tell me about he didn't tell me about the submarine. No, like didn't he uh, didn't he watch a torpedo approach the ship? Oh yeah, Frank's best man. Okay. Frank, the guy who never shined his shoes. Right. Okay. Yeah, John York with the wool uniform. Yeah, he he's my brother-in-law's best man. He was on watch on the bow and he saw this torpedo go by and you know the torpedo wake. You don't mm -hmm. see the torpedo, but anyway. Uh, um, he kept telling about it, telling about it. He said it just missed us, and then it just missed us. Boy, it was about that. And then it missed us. Uh, every time he'd tell it, would get closer and closer. Sort of like when he catches a fish. Huh? Yeah, that's it. Fish. Yeah, the fish go that way, and the torpedoes go this way. <laughs> a lot of similarities. Uh, we wanted to ask you about the uh, the damage and devastation you saw to the. Bremer Haven area when you were there. Yeah, what about Bremer Did Haven? Did you see a lot of uh, uh, devastation and damage? Oh, well, you know, one time in Bremer Haven, I was in a, a uh, minefield. You know, I, I was by myself. This is after we, uh, after we played those devastating football games, okay. and I got organized again. Anyway, I was walking looking at all these beautiful ships. You know, the Germans have some beautiful ships. And I was admiring them. And so this 
British guy said, hey there, Yank, you're in a minefield, you know. And I just stood still, <laughs> and I said, how do I get out of this? He said, see if you can come back the same way you went in. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> you know, yeah. I got back, but I don't know if it was quite the same or not. Yeah, my goodness. <laughs> That's all I got. Pat? Well, I have to tell you, this has been a, a, a wonderful interview. Uh, I enjoyed so much hearing about your experience, and, but I, I want to thank you so much for the interview, oh. and I want to thank you for the service to our oh. country. You know, it's a great pleasure, great right. pleasure, and I never did think much about it. Right. That was what my country had coming.